Hansen from the Dane County Extension. Um, and she's gonna talk to us today about growing vegetables in containers. You can take, take it away, Lisa. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks everybody for inviting me here today. It's uh, nice to talk to your group. Um, I want to do just a quick shameless plug before I start here. Uh, if you are interested in classes on gardening, I do have a series called the Green Thumb Gardening Series. I just finished my winter vegetable growing series, but I believe that you can still uh, access the recordings uh, if you register with um, my support staff. So if you go to the Dane County Extension Office site and you click on the horticulture tab, there is a, a list of our green thumb gardening classes. Um, on Monday night, I started our spring series of classes with a talk on Wisconsin wildflowers that you might be interested in. And there are, I believe, six more classes in the series. You can either take all of them or you can take uh, just one or two or however many you want to take. Um, if you take the whole series, there is a slight discount in the price. And um, if you take individual classes, it's um, $12 a class instead of 10. Um, but the other uh, classes are on uh, shade and ornamental tree planting and pruning. Sorry, I'm looking over at the wall where I've got my list hung up. Uh, shrub pruning, Wisconsin butterflies and creating a butterfly garden, ring gardens and pollinator gardens, planning and construction and native plants on that one. Um, then uh, a talk on berries, which includes strawberries, raspberries, and blueberries, and finishing up with perennials for sun and shade uh, on April 17th. So those are all on Monday nights, and they are all recorded. So if you're not able to attend, you can still uh, get the materials. All right, my commercial is now over, and I will start uh, talking about the business at hand, which is growing vegetables in containers. So if you don't have a lot of room or you're um, not wanting to do an in-ground garden for any number of very excellent reasons, um, you can certainly grow quite a few vegetables in containers, as you can see from this photo. Um, you don't have to get as involved as in this photo, but uh, I put this here so that you can see that you can, even if you have a small space, you can make very efficient use of it. Uh, you can do um, vertical gardening, you can um, do lots of different types of vegetables in pots very successfully. So this is an overview then of the presentation. And we'll start out by talking about any of the number of, like I said, good reasons why you might want to uh, garden in containers rather than in the ground. Then we'll talk about different types of containers and the um, uh, reasons you might or might not want to use various types of containers. We'll talk about container soils. Those are very important. It's important to have the proper type of soil so that your vegetables thrive. Uh, proper planting, fertilizing and watering. And then another very important thing, which is pot sizes, choosing the correct pot size for your plant. That is one of the most important things as well. Uh, then we'll talk about siting your plants, where to put them, and a little bit on disease management. And we'll finish up with just a little bit on herbs. All right. Here we go. I will take uh, questions at the end. I've also provided Sarah with a copy of this presentation as a PDF file. So you should be able to review the material anytime you want. All right, so many good reasons why you might wanna garden in containers. Um, I have uh, one of those issues in our teaching garden. And I'm also going to give a shameless plug for that if you ever happen to be in Dane County in the Madison area. Uh, we have a teaching garden here at the Dane County, 
Extension Office. Um, we have uh, an edibles garden as part of that, which has a number of raised beds because the um, teaching garden doesn't have the best soil and particularly not a great soil for vegetables. So all of our vegetables grow in raised beds or in straw bales or in containers. Um, and the garden is open to the public. Uh, you can also find information about it at the Dane County Extension uh, website. There's a tab that says teaching garden. So we have 12 different garden areas among them, the edibles garden, but also a pollinator garden, rain garden, prairie garden, shade garden, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we do grow things there in raised beds. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you today applies to raised beds, including the soils, fertilizing, watering, and all of that good stuff. So another reason why you might want to grow in containers is if you have limited sunlight, and you might need to move your uh, pots around as your trees fill out for the season. So uh, it's a lot easier to uh, move things in pots than in the ground. And if you, like most of us, don't have as much time to garden as you'd like to, uh, having a limited um, number of uh, pots can certainly be helpful in saving time. Uh, as I get older, I've found that it's very nice to have raised up pots and raised beds to garden in as opposed to the ground, so that's helpful too. And you can actually garden on a budget quite nicely in pots. Um, if you also happen to live in an apartment or a condo that has rules that don't allow you to do in-ground gardening, um, it might be that this is your only option if you want to garden in containers. So um, lots of different materials you can use for containers, lots of different flexibilities that gardening in containers gives you. And there are a ton of different types of containers out there. Um, no matter what your taste, uh, you should be able to find something that appeals to you. A couple of things to keep in mind are that small pots and shallow pots are going to dry out a lot faster than deep ones. And when we grow vegetables, we particularly want to make sure that the pots we put them in allow them enough uh, root space, particularly as we get farther into the season. Um, tomatoes are a really good example for that. A lot of people are quite surprised at how much uh, a tomato root system can spread into. So we'll talk a little bit about tomatoes in particular um, in a little while. But also if you have a very tall pot, such as the uh, green one there with the interesting texture, um, do keep in mind that there's often less drainage at the bottom of those kinds of planters. Now, in general, I wouldn't put uh, a vegetable plant in that that had a very shallow root system like lettuce, but I would put a vegetable in there that has a larger root system, such as a tomato or uh, potentially a squash or something like that. Uh, and if you do have a super deep pot like that, you might even consider not filling the entire thing with soil, uh, but perhaps adding some um, plastic water bottles, for example, um, in the bottom as space fillers. And uh, those can um, help alleviate the weight of the container as well. Okay. So if you don't take anything else home today uh, about growing in containers, this is like the one super important rule, which is that all containers must have drainage. Uh, if you don't have drainage, your plants will likely get root rot and not do very well. So you wanna make sure that whatever container you're using, that it has sufficient drainage in it. Also, if you're growing different plants together, um, make sure that they all have the same kinds of needs in terms of sunlight and in terms of uh, water and fertilizer. Um, 
I will be taking uh, questions at the end, just uh, in case I didn't already say that at the beginning. And also make sure that you match your pot size to the plant type and the growth rate. Lots of times you don't realize at the beginning of the season how big that eggplant is going to be. So I'm going to be giving you a list of different plants and pot sizes uh, to help you make those sorts of decisions. Okay, now we'll go into different types of containers and why you might or might not want to use them. Um, clay is a very common type of container and it has some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, you can either look at its porosity as being an advantage or a disadvantage. Um, it does help in terms of making sure that the plant doesn't get too wet, but it does sometimes mean that the plant dries out a lot faster because moisture will wick out through that porous clay and it can dry out the root ball. So that means if you're using a clay container that, or terracotta is another name for that, uh, you want to make sure that that container is large enough so that the root mass is not going to overtake that space and end up drying out. Um, one thing you can do that can help at least in the beginning, not in mid-season, but in the beginning is soaking that pot in water for maybe half an hour before you plant. That will help the clay to absorb some of the water so it's not immediately wicking it out of the soil. Another disadvantage is that you can get either mold or calcium buildup on the outside of those pots. It's not going to hurt your plants, but it um, maybe is a little bit less aesthetically pleasing um, than not having that happen. Do make sure if you grow plants in clay to bring those pots inside uh, over the winter and you ideally want to take the soil out and dispose of it. Um, because if you have wet soil in there, you can end up with your pot cracking, even if it's in your unheated garage. Another disadvantage is that clay is fairly heavy. Um, if it's a small pot, it is fairly inexpensive, but the larger the pot size gets, just like other pots, it tends to get um, more expensive. So um, clay might be one that you uh, use. It might be one that you don't want to use, depending on what plants you're going to grow and what your uh, goals are. Another very common material for pots is either plastic resin or fiberglass. For our purposes, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, they will hold water longer than clay because they're not porous. But there are some issues with plastic. First of all, we've got plenty of plastic in our landfills already, and I can completely understand why you might not want to add to that burden. Also, some colors of plastic like dark green or black can get very hot in the sun. And if you've got your vegetables in the sun, as you should, uh, if they're on the south or west side of the house and you've got sun shining directly on those pots, you can actually cook your roots if the pots are small enough and um, you've got you know, roots right up against that plastic. So that is one disadvantage. Um, they are lighter in weight than either uh, terracotta or uh, ceramic. Uh, so that is a good thing. Um, also, you may find that colors um, will maybe not hold very well in the sun. You can also get UV damage to the pots and they can crack over time, but that can happen with ceramic or uh, terracotta as well. Now, sometimes uh, plastic pots are going to be a lot less expensive, but depending on the type of plastic, the color of the plastic, the size of the pot, and whether it has any fancy fluting on it or uh, maybe a shape like the um, strawberry pot there, those may be quite expensive. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, often there are interesting textures and shapes with plastic pots though. 
And then glazed ceramic. I must admit, this is my favorite type. I grow some vegetables in containers in my home garden, but I grow a lot more annuals in containers. And I use my pots as a, um, a decorative item. So I have a ton of blue ceramic pots uh, scattered around my garden uh, as an accent color. And I counted, I have a shameless number of pots. I mean, it's it's bad. It's like 30, 30 some uh, glazed blue ceramic pots of various sizes and uh, types. And then I wonder why my back hurts in the fall when I have to store all these things. <laughs> that is another thing is of course, pots take up storage space in your garage. But all of that being said, glazed ceramic is still a fairly uh, popular type of material for pots, and it is very pretty. Um, many sizes, colors, textures, shapes of pots. However, they do tend to be expensive. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. Sometimes you can find them used at garage sales and so on. So that can sometimes be a source. Um, do make sure you don't leave them outside over winter because they may crack. And again, they are heavy. I actually, I use a, a hand truck to move a lot of mine around um, the garden so that uh, <laughs> I don't have to carry them. Uh, I do have some very large ones that I use for tomatoes as in the photo here. Wood can be a good option for um, growing vegetables as well, uh, particularly half barrel size. Um, wooden uh, pots are, are great for growing plants in. Uh, some other materials that you might find would be teak wood, cedar wood, redwood, all of those don't decay very easily. So those are often the types of materials that you find being used in wooden pots. All that being said, they don't necessarily last forever. Um, they, you know, wood does eventually decay over time. Um, but if you have a good sturdy wood pot, it's going to last you quite a number of years. And then fairly new on the scene, but very popular are fiber bags. And those, again, are made out of some kind of polypropylene. So there is that plastic um, element to this. But uh, in terms of storage, these are great because you can just fold them up and stick them on a shelf. They're not heavy, of course, so uh, easy to move around. Uh, there are some disadvantages, which include that they need a lot more water and fertilizer than solid pots. That's because the water is going to drain out of the sides as well as the bottom. So these can really dry out very quickly and need to have very vigilant uh, monitoring. Also, uh, some soil will sift out since it is uh, a porous material. You may have some coming out the bottom, you may have some coming out the sides. So if you have it on your deck, or on your sidewalk, there probably will be a muddy spot next to that. Um, one of the uh, things that is often grown in these types of pots are uh, potatoes. You can see one of those potato bags there in the picture on the bottom where they have a special little flap where you can reach in and harvest uh, the potatoes as they grow during the season. So uh, that is yet another type of container that you may want to try. And they come in all different shapes and there are many different colors now out on the market too. All right, so you've learned then about materials for containers. You can decide which ones fit your needs best. Now we're gonna talk about soils. There are a ton of different brands of soils out there. And it's very easy to get highly confused when you go into the garden center and you're trying to figure out which type of soil to use in your pots. 
So any kind of potting soil is probably fine. That's the good news. Um, there are potting soils that are labeled as organic, such as the ones in the bottom. And there are ones that may have um, some kind of um, gel in them that retains water, or they may have a slow release fertilizer in them, or they may have none of those things in them. But you do want to have a major component of your soil in your pots be a potting mix of some kind. And you, I don't actually recommend using potting mix straight because it tends to be uh, very lightweight and kind of devoid of nutrition unless it's got uh, a slow release fertilizer mixed in. What I usually do for my pots is I amend that potting soil no more than two to one, um, two parts potting soil to one part compost. Um, so you can get like composted manure in bags or topsoil in bags. Um, you can mix in, uh, you know, like I said, two to one, two parts potting soil to one part um, topsoil or manure. Make sure you mix it up uh, really well. And that will help add not only nutrition to your soil, but it will also make it a little bit heavier. Now, if you just used plain topsoil or plain uh, composted manure or plain leaf compost, uh, that's pretty heavy and in a container situation kind of tends to turn into a brick. So that's why you want to use the potting soil is to keep that light and uh, able to um, have the roots get appropriate oxygen. But again, you don't want it to also be the only thing that you're growing in. Now, some of these mixes you're gonna find are heavier than other mixes. Uh, and if you try a couple different mixes, you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, some of the organic ones in particular generally tend to be um, heavier uh, in texture and weight than um, the non-organic type products. So again, many brands out there, I'm not uh, recommending necessarily either of these, they're just examples. But this is um, fairly indicative of what a potting mix would look like. Now, once you've added uh, composted manure or topsoil, you're going to see uh, less of some of those particles because you're diluting them with the uh, topsoil or um, compost. But typically what you're gonna find in a potting soil is it's going to have some kind of mineral component um, often it's a, a mined product such as vermiculite or perlite. Those are both mined from the earth. Um, perlite is a, uh, uh, a, a type of rock that is um, uh, treated with heat so that it puffs up and it gets a lot of air pockets in it, which is why it floats if you've ever had a potting mix uh, with that in there. Um, perlite does tend to float. Um, vermiculite is um, pretty much a type of mica. It's a layered uh, product. And if it's milled, it's very fine textured, but you can also get it coarse grade as well. So you may see these kind of shiny gold uh, pieces in your potting mix, and that is probably vermiculite. There's also going to be an organic component. It might be peat moss. It might be fir bark, it might be pine bark, it might be um, a, a shredded coconut fiber. Um, they're also using um, reeds, uh, you know, type grass material that's been finely ground as well. So any or all of those may be part of your uh, mix. And if you look at the bag, it should tell you what actually is in there. Again, many have a slow release fertilizer incorporated. Uh, if that is the case, you may not need to add any other fertilizer during the year, uh, but there are some vegetables that need more fertilizer than others, so you still might need to add something. 
And again, the great thing about these potting mixes, uh, and again, they they may not actually have any soil in them. They typically are soil less. So again, they look like they're soil, but they're actually either peat or fir bark or any of these other things that I've mentioned as the organic component. But they tend to be very lightweight. They hold water really well. And so they're great for root growth. All right. So when you actually go to planting your plants, now you may decide that you're going to um, grow your plants from seed. And in that case, uh, I would recommend only things that have the fairly large seeds that would be direct seeded, such as um, any of your cucurbits, which would be your melons, your uh, squash, your cucumbers, uh, those you could direct seed into a pot. You could also direct seed peas or beans into a pot. Otherwise, I'd recommend that you use transplants. Uh, so those would be the plants that you buy in the greenhouse, or maybe you've started uh, in your own house from seed, such as peppers or tomatoes that you started inside. Do keep in mind the mature size of the plant. Now, if you've purchased them from um, a garden center, particularly if it's towards the end of the season, be mindful of the roots. Uh, if you find that your roots are going around and around and around, you should try and straighten those roots out and spread them out a little bit. Uh, if it's earlier in the season, you still can straighten the roots out just a little bit. And if you find that they're very dry, please water them first before you actually plant them. That will help them um, have less stress. And you may find also that your potting media is pretty dry, if, especially if you've stored a uh, soilless media or potting mix for a while, it tends to get quite dry. So make sure that that is wetted down first. Now, sometimes people ask about, do I have to put anything over the drainage holes? Usually it's not necessary, but uh, if it's a, a large drainage hole, you know, maybe an inch or more in diameter, because some pots do have fairly big holes, uh, you can use um, a leaf. I like to use a, a weed leaf um, because they're free and they're unfortunately plentiful. Um, and I'll put that over the hole and it will decay in time and not impede the flow of water out of the pot. Or uh, I may have, you know, a, a paper towel, uh, just a single layer of that. If you happen to have a sheet of newspaper, you can put just a small piece of newsprint over um, the hole as well. Or again, you don't have to do that at all. Um, make sure that you, if you're, if you're reusing soil and it's technically not recommended from a horticultural standpoint, but um, I do understand that soil is expensive and I can understand if you want to reuse some soil, if you're going to do that, uh, first of all, I would not reuse a whole pot of soil. I would add some new um, media to it. And I also would not reuse anything that has had a plant in it that either uh, died or was diseased. Uh, so I would toss that old soil. I wouldn't reuse it in uh, your compost or in um, a like a raised bed or something like that. I would get rid of it. And you might even need to get rid of um, the pot as well. All right, then moving on to fertilizer. So if you're growing plants from seed, uh, wait till they get to be at least an inch tall before you start adding extra fertilizer. And again, if you already have fertilizer in that soil, the uh, potting mix, you probably don't need to add more. Um, there are some um, garden plants um, vegetables that actually will not bear very well if they get too much fertilizer, especially nitrogen-based fertilizer. 
Um, you still, you know, you want to make sure they have adequate fertility, but you don't want to over fertilize. So if you um, haven't looked at a bag of fertilizer very carefully before, uh, you'll note that it has three numbers on it. Those stand for the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order that are in the product. And these are the three macronutrients that plants use and need the most of. Uh, you may find that there are also other micronutrients in there or secondary macronutrients, uh, and that's fine, uh, but you obviously need the, the first three. Now, I would be careful if you're using a turf fertilizer. Most turf fertilizers do not have any phosphorus in them uh, because of a law that was passed um, trying to keep extra phosphorus out of our waterways and our um, drinking water. And so turf fertilizers in the state of Wisconsin are regulated. Uh, so you usually will not be able to get one that has any phosphorus in it. However, uh, that's because there's in most parts of the state plenty of phosphorus already in our soils. Uh, but since you're growing in a container, your plant very much does need phosphorus. So make sure that uh, you're using the right type fertilizer there. Now, uh, fertilizers come in a number of different formats. Uh, most of the traditional ones are what we call water soluble, where you dissolve them in water and the nutrients would be available right away. However, there are what we call the slow release products, which are typically going to be granules or little prills, uh, and those will release the nutrients slowly over time. And it should say on the package which one you're dealing with. Now, if you prefer to use strictly organic products, that is fine too. You can certainly do that. Uh, you can get a number of different types of things. Um, you can get... Uh, um, well, Purple Cow produces a compost tea bag where you just, you take the bag and you suspend it in water and the nutrients will diffuse out of that bag. Or you can make your own compost tea uh, using some soil from your garden, a nylon stocking, um, an aquarium pump, and water. And it's pretty, uh, pretty easy to make. Um, it's you know relatively inexpensive. You've got the cost of the bucket and the aquarium pump, which doesn't actually cost too much. And I would bet that um, many of us have old nylon stockings at home that are not particularly functional anymore. Uh, so you can you know you can certainly use that. Um, you can also buy fish emulsion, for example. Um, there are also other types of organic uh, fertilizer products that you can use. I would not use bat guano, however, uh, which is one of the organic products out there. I don't think I would want to use that product as a fertilizer for edible uh, plants. Uh, the other thing about any kind of organic product, and these can come from various um, uh, various places. A lot of the things like blood meal, bone meal, those come from the slaughter industry. Um, fish emulsion, that comes from the fishing industry. Then you have your uh, manures that obviously come from animals that are uh, being raised either for dairy or for meat. So uh, the other thing that you can sometimes find is leaf compost, and that is just like the compost that you would make in your garden, but composting is a whole nother talk, so <laughs> I'm not going to go into that too much right now. But the upshot of this that I want you to understand is that organic products are typically more complex than traditional ones because they do come from organic sources, so they've got more nutrients, but they've typically got them in much, much lower concentrations. And that means that you need to apply them much more often than you would a traditional product. Also, because they are organic, those nutrients are not available right away when you water them in uh, to your pots. They need to be broken down by microbes first. And that's another reason to have some compost or topsoil in your potting um, mix uh, because a typical potting mix 
doesn't have as many microbes and fungi and bacteria as you would find in compost or uh, topsoil. So uh, those microbes are going to be needed to break down those organic fertilizer products. Um, one thing to think about is if the plants are very dry in the pot, make sure that you just water it first with just clear water. Uh, allow the material to rehydrate before you um, fertilize. And I'd say even with a liquid type of fertilizer. So if it's very dry, water first. Now, if you're using a water-soluble product, um, examples of that might be Peters or miracle Grow or any of those. Generally, you're going to apply every two to three weeks but follow the package directions for vegetables. And I would actually look for a type of uh, water-soluble product that is meant for vegetables. Some of the ones that are meant for annuals um, might be too concentrated and you don't want to have too much nitrogen, which encourages leafy growth at the expense of fruits. So if you're growing something, you wanna eat the fruit like a tomato or a pepper or a cucumber, um, you, you do need some nitrogen, but you don't want excess nitrogen. Now, if you're eating the leaf of something like a lettuce or a spinach or kale, then you could probably use a product that has more nitrogen in it. And tomatoes are particularly uh, sensitive to being over fertilized. So make sure that you don't do that. Also, plants use less fertilizer during very hot weather. They're not growing as quickly. Uh, they're just trying to keep up with their water needs. So there is no point in stressing them by adding extra fertilizer. And then again, um, most slow release fertilizer, if you look at the package, a lot of them last for three months. So you probably can just add it once and be done. Watering, how often do you water? Uh, in the beginning of the season, you don't have to check, you know, you can check every couple of days or so. But once the warm weather hits, um, I would say around June, do start checking every day or every other day. And when do you water? Well, if the upper inch of media is dry or if you see any kind of wilting, it's probably time to water. When you do water, you want to water well so that water comes out the bottom of the pot. You don't want to have a lot of little light waterings that don't sink all the way through the soil profile. If you're growing in smaller pots or hanging baskets in particular, and particularly um, some of the um, um, hanging tomato types, uh, they will dry out very quickly in a hanging basket. So do check them uh, every day. But other than that, I can't really give you any specific guidance in a you know recipe type fashion because it's going to depend on the type of crop, how big the pot is, what your potting soil is like, what the temperatures have been like, if there's been a lot of wind, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the moral of the story there is be vigilant and check often. Now, just because you see a plant wilting does not necessarily mean that it needs water. Unfortunately, some of our cucurbits in particular are susceptible to bacterial wilts, um, and they also often will wilt from heat. Uh, so a lot of those plants that have really big leaves if you see that they're wilting um, in the middle of the day, but then they're recovering either in the evening or by morning, it might be heat related, but it also could be a bacterial wilt. If that's the case, eventually they will get to the point where uh, they can't take up enough water because their root system has been compromised and they will stay wilted and eventually die. It is also possible we've uh, talked about overwatering as being a problem, and that will also compromise the root system. Uh, rotted roots don't take up water well, so you do get that wilting symptom. Also, again, if your plants are in pots that are too small for the root system, they will wilt a lot. Uh, so you should then repot them into something bigger. So, um, 
try and do a little bit of detective work to figure out why your plants are wilting if you see that happening. Now, if you're not confident in your ability to know when it's time to water, you may want to get one of these handy dandy little gadgets, um, a water meter. You stick it in the soil a couple of inches and it has a little gauge on it that will tell you whether the soil is dry or moist or wet. And if it's dry, you certainly wanna water. If it's more towards the dry end of moist, you might also want to water. There are a ton of different brands out there. This is just a representative um, photo of one. Most are uh, relatively reasonable in terms of cost, and especially if you're growing a lot of plants in uh, containers, it might be a good investment for you. Um, there was a nice review at this site, the spruce.com, where they reviewed a number of uh, moisture meters. And I think that was either 21 or 22 that they did that in. Um, so it's relatively recent as well. Okay, this is a super important slide. I know it's got a ton of text on it, but this is one of those that I think you will be coming back to again and again. So um, this has large vegetables, medium vegetables, and small vegetables, and some recommended pot sizes. Um, uh, there are different pot sizes in the nursery industry. If you were to ask somebody working in a greenhouse, you know, and say, I need a five gallon pot, or I need an eight gallon pot, or a 10 gallon pot, they would know what you're talking about and be able to show you that. If you're ordering um, over the uh, internet uh, and just you know use those uh, as part of your search term, a 10 gallon pot, for example. And once you know visually what that looks like, you can easily extrapolate that to other types of more decorative pots uh, so that you'll know when you're looking at, it, oh, that's a two gallon pot that uh, will work for uh, my basil plant. Um, but it will not work for uh, my pepper plant or eggplant uh, and realize that you need, you know, fairly good size pots for tomatoes and um, peppers, uh, you know, full size peppers, eggplants, cucumbers, winter squash. Now, uh, lots of times we're going to recommend that you grow either dwarf or what we would call bush varieties, if you're growing in pots. Um, that is just a lot better for the plant than if you were trying to grow a full-sized plant. So the dwarf varieties, even though you know we have a full-size pepper, we have a dwarf pepper, we have um, a patio tomato or a paste tomato, which is a determinant size uh, that's only going to get like three to four feet tall as opposed to an indeterminate one that's going to keep growing all season and may end up being six feet tall or more by the end of the season. So that's the difference between those and why the same type of plant might need a different size pot. Some other general rules, um, vegetables need at least six hours of sunlight, ideally eight hours or more. However, if you're growing lettuce or spinach, they may be able to survive with a little less. You can even grow them under uh, the shade of uh, trees that have very small leaves like a honey locust or have a very thin canopy such as a birch. Uh, you could probably grow those under um, the just the edge of the canopy uh, of those if you are short on space. And again, choosing um, varieties that are compact or bush type, if you've ever seen like bush cucumbers, bush beans, um, those are ones that are, are going to be more suited for culture in pots. And that being said, you can grow almost anything uh, in a pot as long as it's large enough for the root system. So we're not going to go through this long list. You can you can read through that later. Now um, you need to manage disease if it should occur, the same as you would in an in-ground garden. Uh, so there are a few things that you can do. 
first of all, if you're growing tomatoes, tomatoes are kind of the poster child for disease in the garden. Just figure you're going to have some tomato disease. It's all in how you manage it. Um, also, there are varieties that are less susceptible to disease, like there are some cucumbers that are um, either resistant to or tolerant of powdery mildew. There are some tomato varieties that are resistant to um, like late blight, uh, which is a terrible disease that can completely kill off your tomato plant. Um, but also there are other diseases that are foliar diseases that are not as severe, but you can still lose a lot of foliage. Uh, so using disease resistant seeds, if you're starting your own, or using disease resistant plants may be a good way to go if you've had problems in this area. So some other things that you can do is, first of all, um, ideally not reuse soil especially don't reuse it if the plant was diseased. And if you are going to reuse some of it, do mix it with new soil. Ideally, if there was a pot that a plant died in uh, or had a bad disease like late blight, um, you would not want to reuse that pot even if you disinfect it. Um, and we do recommend scrubbing out the pots and disinfecting with a 10% bleach solution. Uh, each year. Also, if you are reusing any soil, do be sure and rotate the crop families that you're um, growing, just the same as you would in uh, garden soil and an in-ground garden. And finally, keep the plants um, well spaced, don't crowd them. And for things like tomatoes, you can see the one in the picture has a very dense uh, crown there, dense canopy. You can prune some of that out for better air circulation. That helps to deter fungal pathogens. So this is what um, rotation might look like if you are again reusing some of that soil. Uh, you would want to make sure that you don't grow any vegetable plant in the same family uh, several consecutive years. You want to have a three or four year rotation between families. So if you were growing uh, anything in the onion family, it should be three years uh, before you put that in the same uh, soil, if you were reusing that soil for that long. And the reason for that is that diseases do tend to build up in soil uh, when you're growing the same family over time and particularly um, things in the nightshade family, the eggplants, peppers, potatoes, and tomatoes. Again, I mentioned that tomatoes are kind of disease magnets, so a couple different strategies. Uh, thin the canopy so that uh, there's good airflow. You can prune the suckers off. That will also help to thin out the canopy and increase your harvest as well. So suckers are these growths between the main leaf and the stem, and you can um, you should remove all of them uh, except for the one that is closest to the lowest fruit cluster. So if there are any at the ground level, remove those and remove the next ones up until you see the uh, flower cluster forming and you can save the sucker under that. Um, any above this, you would also remove those. So you don't need to do this on uh, determinate tomatoes like paste tomatoes, aroma tomatoes, or patio tomatoes. They aren't going to sucker very much anyway, but the indeterminate ones that keep growing all year long, like the cherry tomatoes, uh, some of the heirloom tomatoes, and so on, um, it's helpful to remove those suckers. And you do your first sucker removal in late June or early July, and then do it again every um, 10 to 14 days after that first pruning. We're almost done here. Thank you for being so patient. Um, so growing herbs in containers. 
most herbs are well suited for growing in containers. Now, there are some that you have to replant fairly often, such as cilantro. Cilantro will go to seed uh, within a couple of weeks of planting, and then it becomes coriander, which is fine. But if you wanted cilantro, then you're going to need to reseed that. So um, I tend to keep some packages of cilantro seed um, around and just reseed every uh, few weeks. Some of these are perennials, um, such as oregano or marjoram, sage. Well, sage is kind of iffy. Sometimes it survives here in the Madison area, but it probably won't survive for very long. And certainly if you're north of there, it won't survive. You can often bring a lot of these things inside, um, but do be careful about that because it's very easy to bring pests inside over winter. Um, so thyme is another one that's a perennial. Um, and again, you can, you can grow a lot of them inside as long as you have sufficient light. Um, for starting them outside during the growing season, keep in mind that they like a lot of sun and heat, just like vegetables do. And if you started basil seeds inside, don't put them out too early because they're very intolerant of cold. Uh, if you're growing annuals in pots, of course, you don't necessarily have to overwinter them. Uh, if you are growing perennials and you do want to overwinter them, then you're probably going to be bringing them inside. You can either try growing them as a house plant or you can try storing them in your uh, unheated garage over the winter. Uh, again, if you're growing indoors, watch for various pests, spider mites, aphids, and white flies are fairly common. And uh, rosemary has an unfortunate uh, tendency to get powdery mildew in homes over the winter. Just a couple of resources here. These are all websites. Um, I have a number of vegetable books that are great, but none of them really address growing vegetables in containers. So these are either fact sheets or short publications about growing vegetables in containers. And these are um, from different extension sites. And you'll note that we have one here that I put at the top of the list that was written by my former colleague, uh, Patty Nagai. Um, there is one quibble that I have with it, and that is the size of the pot for tomatoes. Um, that particular fact sheet says you can use a five gallon pot. Now you might be able to do that on a Roma or a paste or a patio tomato, um, but for a well, in most cases, that's um, a bare minimum, and I would recommend using an eight-gallon pot uh, as a minimum instead. Okay, so in summary, um, vegetables and herbs need at least six hours of sun, preferably eight, and there are a number of different types of materials, different kinds of uh, pots that you can use, just make sure that the pot has enough space for your vegetables root system and that your container has sufficient drainage, and then to make sure that you keep a very careful eye on water and fertilizer needs. And with that, I would say happy gardening. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, we have a few minutes left for questions. If anybody wants to open it up, I have posted the evaluation link in the chat as well.